And we're going to consider together some truths in the midst of uh, a whole bunch of lies. That is, if you're paying attention, what will happen today at the end of this service, you'll head back out those doors and you will be lied to all day long, every day about everything until you come back into this room again. I mean, that's just what we're dealing with. We've always left the church, the, the truth, and we go out into a world of lies but something, the dial's, been, the dial's been sort of adjusted in a way like I've never seen before. And we're just sort of, you leave here and you swim through lies all week long. Some of you start to, like, I think I'm losing my mind. And then you come back and you gather together in the house of God. And you're like, okay, I'm, I'm sane. And you're actually doing better than you think. And uh, so we're, we're going to consider some truth in the midst of a sea of lies. And when you think of it, you know, it's really true that as God's kids, we do cherish and value an uncommon, an uncommon truth, a truth that isn't you know, just as uh, prevalent, at least culturally, as it once was, which leads us to have thoughts that I would call our uncommon sense thoughts. And an and uncommon sense actually will lead to an uncommon life. And at the end of the day, I think every single soul wants an uncommon life. None of us wakes up and goes, I just want the most normal Get, I just want to get through life. No, we, we want something more. We are made in the image of he who's more and greater than anybody else. So there's something innate in us that really wants the life that Jesus, when he came, he said, you know, I came to give you life and I came to give you abundant life. And there's something in us that desires that life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. An uncommon sense life, but uncommon sense life doesn't really come in un, uncommon or sort of ordinary way. It's not largely... Anyway, but I do want to say, you know, just publicly that I love your pastor. I love this fellowship. Uh, I want to say that our good shepherd cares about good shepherds, and you have one. In fact, you don't have one. You've got a team of people that are, they're good shepherds, and that is, uh, you know, they, 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 they care. And good shepherds will do all kinds of things for their flock, those that God, you know, allows by grace for them to minister to, to love and to lead. And the least of these is not putting aside his or her own agenda, you know, uh, their own wants uh, for, the, for the greater of the whole. And so I think what you saw in Nate's video there was really sort of a genuine demonstration of, of, of a real shepherd who looks on and goes, this is Baptism Sunday. I want to be here for Baptism Sunday. And so I got the call earlier in the week, you know, and... Uh, Nate was like, man, my wife tested positive for COVID prior to Easter. A couple days, she started to feel bad. And uh, so she and the kids, they quarantined. We did, they weren't around for Easter service. J Jen's been quarantined. I, when I talked to him on Monday or Tuesday, I'm, f I'm completely fine. I've got no symptoms whatsoever. And uh, so what do you think I ought to do? He's like, man, I, I don't, uh, I just don't, though I don't feel anything, I've got a scenario that might appear to be inappropriate if I came. I certainly don't want to put anybody at risk, and I don't want the ministry of Awakened to be in any way sort of seen as not considerate of what it is that's going on. And so as much as I want to be there with you all, could you, you think you could come and cover me for the week, and I just think it's the best, and especially on our big day. And I said, yeah, man, I'd be glad to come. We've got a baptism today, too. There and it's outside actually in the in the in the, in, the, in so pray pray for us because <laughs> it's like can you imagine getting baptized over in that river that's what we're doing later on today and uh, six o'clock this evening six to eight whoever came up with that idea it wasn't me I'm like <laughs> it's going to be chilly um, but anyway um, just glad to be here with you and if I I think based upon uh, where Nate and his family's at he should be back here with you next weekend but for today you're stuck with me. So I want to talk about an uncommon sense, an uncommon sense life. I picked up the idea from an old, from an old uh, devotional that a bunch of people used to read a long time ago. Uh, Oswald Chambers wrote a little devotional called My Utmost for His Highest. Probably some of you are familiar with it. And he talks about this uncommon sense life, and I've never forgot it. But uh, nevertheless, um, contrary to what many skeptics believe, the Christian life on the whole, really is quite rational. That is, the teachings of the church, Christian teaching by and large makes a lot of logical sense, you know, on many practical levels. I mean, think about the Ten Commandments. Like, that's like a pretty good place to start, right? A lot of us suffered because we didn't do it the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you. I actually had to learn that the hard way. 
I didn't honor my father and mother, and it didn't go well with me. And uh, so, and you look on, and you go, you shall not murder. That, that'll help. Right? That'll, that'll make a difference. Uh, don't commit adultery if, you're, if you want to not destroy your life. Uh, don't steal. And you, you won't end up like this, you know, in the back of a car. Uh, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Again, that's some, that's some pretty good stuff there. That's gold. And uh, nothing really uncommon or counterintuitive about that. It all makes perfect sense in civilized societies. In fact, I don't think you, have, you can't have civil society without this kind of, these kinds of foundational principles and ideas. So I think about it, the way Christianity teaches us to deal with one another. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's not like counterintuitive. You go, hey, I would love someone to do for me the way I, I'm going to do to you the way I'd want you to do to me. The way we speak to one another. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only that which is helpful, that which would edify and build somebody else up. Uh, the respect that we're to render to our elders and to those in authority over us. I mean, again, there's so much about the Christian life that just make it's just good common sense stuff. That there's nothing sort of just nothing short of common sense. But then, listen, there is a lot that's pretty paradoxical, right? That you just look on and go, hmm. And, and it's when we get to the paradoxes. And there are many in the Christian life that the uncommon sense life begins to sort of emerge in us. And I want to focus just on four simple areas. Um, I'm not, I'm going to, we're going to go to several different places. I'm not going to have you start in any particular passage. But we're going to talk about four particular areas. And uh, we're going to end with the one that sort of is happening today. We're going to end with baptism because uh, on the surface you look on and go, so you mean to tell me that when I go in that tank this afternoon... Something's going to happen? I mean, naturally, right? You go, so like anyone can get wet. What, 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 what is this? And then that makes no sense. Like nothing's going to happen. There's nothing magic. That's that, that water's not from Israel or the Jordan River. You know what I mean? You're like, so what, what's, what's, what, what, what is it? And there, there are a lot of things like that. So here's the four areas. We're going to talk about stewardship. We're going to talk about servanthood. We're going to talk about prayer. And finally, because some are going to take the plunge. Today, we're going to talk about baptism. And then again, I'll be, I'll be brief on each of these, but I want to kind of consider them in the context of like, so what is it? Servanthood, stewardship, prayer, baptism. Um, what does it require of us? And then what are the kinds of things that we see when, though it doesn't make sense on the surface, we actually step out in faith and do what God calls us to do. So stewardship, I, I got stewardship and success. And, and as I, I want to deal specifically with that part of stewardship that has to do with how we handle our money. And I say that loosely. So stewardship is essentially the recognition that all that we have came from and belongs to God. And since that's true, and that's true biblically, as everything you've got, everything I've got came from him, belongs to him. And since that's true, there's a responsibility that we have as stewards to actually handle his stuff because it's all his. Accordingly, uh, Paul, you know, uses some really broad strokes to address the issue. I think I've got it here on the screen for you. It says, moreover, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. Stewards must be found faithful. And uh, every child of God is a steward of things that don't belong to him. They're all, they're all his, as we talk about just our earthly resources. Um, now, the specific context of this particular verse is that we are good stewards of the mysteries of God, the truths of God. That is, you know, those of us that have come to faith, our eyes have been opened, we recognize that we're sinners, we know that there's a, a true and holy God who actually sent His Son to die for us, or has redeemed us with his, own, with his precious blood. That's a truth that you don't just keep in, right? At some, at some point, that's, that's the thing that's missing in anyone who hasn't come to, come to Christ. And without that, nothing's ever going to make sense. But nevertheless, in other places, Paul actually speaks about what it is that we do with our practical resources. And there was a time in Israel's history where God actually warned Israel um, against forgetting this very thing that all that they've ultimately got actually came from him in the first place. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read quickly. Listen, this is Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um, the Lord speaking to the children of Israel says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you've eaten and are full and you've built, you've built beautiful houses to dwell within, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, 
when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which there were fiery serpents, scorpions in a thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock? Who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, that he might test you to do good to you in the end? Then you say in your heart, my power and my might, the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Of course, one of the ways in which the Lord, you know, sort of challenged the children of Israel was he came along in the old covenant and gave to them these these offerings, these faith offerings. There was the first fruit offering and there were tithes of all that they had. And God asked in a sense, I want you to share those with me. Well, not because God needs anything, right? It's not like, you know, we're actually getting a little low up here. Could you guys, could you help me out? I need some of your, I need the first fruits. I need some resources. No, no, that's not that. It's just, see, God wants to show you that he hears you, that he cares, that he's there. And uh, haven't you found that every area of your life that you've submitted to him, surrendered to him, it's, it's blessed, right? It's whole, the, the crooked places he makes straight. And that's, that's true with your resources, his resources that you get a chance to manage, as well as with your marriage, it is with you know, all kinds of things. So nevertheless, this, if you want to think about it, this is one of those areas where you say, if you want to get ahead financially, about the last thing that you would want to do is, is, is give, as, give as much away as you possibly can. That's kind of counterintuitive, right? So like if I've got... If I've got a pile here that's mine, and by the way, there's nothing ungodly about wanting your resources to grow. We, we, we you know, in the West, we, we've, had, we've got so much time that we just tinker with a bunch of stuff. So in the church, you've got like the prosperity gospel, which basically says the more you have, the more godly you are. And then there's the poverty gospel that says the less you have, the more like Jesus you are. And neither, somebody just fell out back there. <laughs> that was a, as a revelation and someone's just like, you know, Someone's like, thank God, you know, I don't have to make my little pile get smaller. No. So here's the deal. So, so imagine with me here. Imagine with me, you know, just think, of, think about what it is that God's asking us to do and think about, in a sense, how it just doesn't make sense. So what your scripture would say, so here's your resources. They're yours. Nothing wrong with wanting those to grow, right? There's reasons and good reasons for that, good, not good reasons for that. So you come along here and you go, you want those resources to grow. You go, yeah, I want those resources to grow. Okay, then take as much of that as you can and give it to like the bank of God. Uh, well, like where would you, where do you put it? Where do you, how do you get it there? How does it, how do you give it, like give it to God? Well, places like this, right? This is where the work of God is happening on the earth. So t- take, some, take these, some, some, some of your resources. In fact, if he can take a few loaves and fishes and break, distribute and bless multitudes, like how much more can he do with just what it is that we put into his hands? So what I want you to do is take from your pile and I want you to give it away. And then this pile is going to grow. You go, no, no, I'm not stupid. If I got, 10, I, got, I got 10 gallons of gold here and I just gave away two and now I got eight. Watch and see. What, it doesn't make any sense. I know, but you and I weren't called to live a common sense life. We were called to live an uncommon sense life. And it's when we do this thing that doesn't make any sense that God shows up and he starts doing things on your behalf that don't make any sense. I mean, we could stop and go, anyone want to come up and take the podium? Some of you are like, yeah, after the start we've had so far, I'll take the podium. We'll finish this thing and we'll get to lunch. <laughs> no, but listen, you, you've got to, you, uh, we could come up here and we could tell story after story after story in this room right here where you said, I, I came to faith, my sins were forgiven. I began to learn from scripture about the fact that God owns it all. I began to take his money because I recognize it's his now and give more and more of it away to God. In fact, there have been many times you might say that I actually wrote my tithe check or my, my gift to Awaken Church. And I thought, Lord, if you, I mean, if, if this is going to go bad. You know what I mean? Like there's going to be a lot more month than money if I take this and I put it in the box. Only, and you guys can come up here and you only to say, not only did we make it that month, we made it in such a way that it was like God. It had to be God. And listen, I can just tell you this, that you know, we, this, our, our life of faith is often occupied with sort of invisible things, right? We, we serve a savior that we can't see. We have these principles about what happens in our minds and our hearts and our attitudes. And, and you, there's a lot that's sort of not so tangible. Listen, to me, 
there's almost nothing more tangible in the life of the believer of what actually happens, like what actually happens when you step out and go, this doesn't really make sense to me, but I'm going to trust the Lord regularly and consistency with, consistently with the resources he's given me. And God goes, listen, listen, I'll actually literally affect your bottom line. Now, there, there, this is just one particular facet. We don't give to God so that we can get. But it is true that when Paul talks about the issue, he talks about the issue in this way. Listen, he says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds, he has a, he has a, he has a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart. Notice he talks about sowing seed and he talks about money. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, willfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others, as the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and then the bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. That's the Bible. That's the New Testament. That's, particular, that's one particular facet of what God comes along and says, listen, I'm going to ask you to trust me with this particular area of your life. I know that it doesn't make common sense, but watch and see what I do when you live an uncommon sense life. And you go, that verse came to pass. I, I've actually increased and I've got more now to share with others. Listen, if you'll go through life and you'll start now, if you'll go through life and you'll open up your hands to your resources and say, Lord, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll start to regularly, faithfully participate with you in the things of heaven. If you'll keep your hands open, the Lord looks down and says, as long as your hands are open, I'll, 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 fill, I'll fill them. And I'll keep filling them. And I'll keep filling them. And I'll keep filling them. Just, and, and you will be a conduit, because that's the way God works. You'll be a conduit to my blessings to a whole bunch of people. And listen, it's a lot of fun to give. It really is. To be, able, to be the source of blessing and life. I love the line that we have on the screen. There's no greater investment than the souls, the eternal souls of others. I think that's sort of a, an awakened idea. Uh, What's well, a biblical idea? They, didn't, they stole it from the Bible. <laughs> but I can tell you this, you guys. I'm, I'm, no, I'm no financial advisor. When I was in college, I, I was talking to Pastor Devon earlier, and I went to college. That is, I actually physically was at the place. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't get anything done when I was at college other than the stuff you're not supposed to do. So I went to college, forsook my education. I am no financial advisor, but I promise you what I'm going to tell you now is better than the wisest financial planet, uh, advisor on the planet. Listen, take as much as you can and get into the hands of him who can do anything, do exceedingly abundantly above anything you can ask, think or imagine. Listen, you'll be just fine. You'll be just fine. You'll be fine. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got kids. Uh, my first is about ready to be married. I know most of you are like, there's no way you look so young. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. But... Uh, and uh, I've, I've shared with my kids, look, dad's not some, I'm not, a, I'm not a financial wizard. I can just tell you this. Start with the little that God's given you now. Invite him into the scenario. And for the rest of your life, you'll be just fine. That doesn't mean you won't suffer periods of leanness, but you will always have him as an advocate. He's, he's promised. He's promised. And he who promises never lies. Right. Amen. Right. He's got you. Trust him. So secondly, I want to talk about servanthood. So you got stewardship. You got on the surface. That doesn't make any sense. Now let's talk about servanthood and success. That's sort of the, the uncommon sense idea here is that we are going to choose to sincerely position ourselves in any and every context that we find ourselves in the, in the lowest possible way we can. And if we do, listen, something high and exalted ultimately happens. If the stewardship paradox is, we protect our giving or, or our gains by our giving, then the paradox that we're about to look at here is going low, going low, vol volitionally like Jesus going low will um, lead to great heights. Again, altogether uncommon. It's counter, it's counter culture. It's counterintuitive. I mean, if I, make myself, if I make myself a servant in every single situation, I'm never going to be a ruler in, every, in any particular case. You know, isn't like, isn't, success being at the top of the ladder, not at the, not, not at the lowest rung. Here's one of my favorite parables, Luke 14. 
Um, I love this. It's so good. Try to picture this. When Jesus noticed, Jesus has invited these people to a party, and he sits back and he notices how people sort of position themselves when they come into the room. Can you imagine? So, so imagine this room is like this really long table, and you've been invited to the party by Jesus, which means you're somebody, right? So it says when Jesus noticed, noticed <laughs> that all, notice, everyone did this, that all who came to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit at the seat of honor. What if someone who's more distinguished than you uh, has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you'll be embarrassed in front of everybody and you'll have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Isn't that great? So there's this attitude in your heart because you got invited by Jesus and you're at the party. He says, everybody did this. So you walk in and you're thinking, there's, this, there's the seat of honor because clearly it's like that's where Jesus is sitting and I'm invited. So surely he wants me. There's 175 seats here. Surely he wants me as close to him as possible. He invited me. So you sit down and you smile while everyone else is coming in like, yeah, I mean, it's, look, how, look how close I am to, like, I'm the most important. And you have no idea who's coming. And Jesus comes in and goes, hey, what are you doing? I'm just sitting here. He goes, no, I got another spot for you. Where? Well, that's actually way, way, way down there. And so get up in front of everybody and go way down there. That'd be fun, right? Mm -mm. No, everybody this. He says this. Instead, this is Jesus' counsel. Instead, take the lowest seat at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, I've got a better place for you. Then you'll be honored in front of all the other guests. He picks you up at the, at the end. And then you're walking by 175 people. Where, I wonder where I'm going. I wonder, I wonder where I'm going. You're no longer, you, you, because you came in with an attitude, I'll just take, I'll be glad to be here. I'll sit down there. He picks you up and goes, no, I'll take you up here. Somebody once said of this passage, and it's, it's here. Listen, if you and I are ever, ever humbled by Christ, it's because we made him. We made him. He doesn't go like, oh, you know what? Jesus doesn't wake up in the morning and go, I just can't wait to humble the tar out of somebody. I mean, I'm going to humble you so bad. No, no. The only time that Christ ever humbles any of us is when we, you know, you know remember the game as a kid, whack-a-mole? You know, when that little thing pops up? Like, whenever that thing pops up, you know, you want to swack that deal? It's like, as long as you go around sticking your head up, somebody's going to pop it. And when it's Jesus, it's really embarrassing, right? It's like, and he can pop a head, you know, he's not going to miss. So, so, so notice what he says. Listen, then you will be honored in front of all the other guests for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Not could be, should be, will be humbled. And those who humble themselves, like you choose volunteer. Listen, will be exalted. It's a personal, it's the personal mindset that we adopt before we get to the party. It's the personal mindset that we get if you're here and you're a business owner before you walk into the office. Or if you're an employee before you get to work. Or if you're a dad who's coming home to five kids. It's the, it's the attitude that when you're driving home and you're like, I'm so tired. I do not want to be a servant. I want to walk in. I want my kids to take off my feet, my shoes, not my feet. <laughs> Rub my feet. Tell me what's for dinner. That, that's a very different scenario. Most guys are like, I'm the one who went to work. No, no. Your job started the moment you left the office. The most important job you've got is the day when soon you walk through those doors. But we don't walk. We walk through those doors like, I'm ready to be served. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to serve and actually give my life, to give my life away as a ransom for many. It's the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal to God. But listen to this. This is heavy. Talk about something countercultural, but made himself of no reputation. Take that verse in Philippians 2 and put it by anything social media. Now, I don't, I don't have social media, not because I'm more holy than you. I just can't hardly turn on my phone. So here's the deal. But listen, social media is not about making yourself of no reputation. 
That's why you took 75 selfies with filters and the right light. And then they're like, that's your profile. And someone meets you, you're like, that's not you. <laughs> no, that's me, really. I'm like, no. No, because you weren't making yourself of no reputation. You're doing everything you can to make a reputation. That whole world is scary. It's backwards. Look at me, look at me, like me, look at me, look at me, like me, like me, like, 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 like me. Christ is like, no, I came into the room and it was like, God, don't even, no one even needs to know that I'm here. I've just got a job to do. They don't, they don't like me. I need a profile. I'm just going to come in and go, who, who has a need? Old John Corson used to say there's two kinds of people in life. Those who walk in the room and say, here I am. And the others who walk in the room and say, there you are. That's very, very different. Very, very different. That is a, that's an MO, a mindset, a modus, the way that we choose to live our lives or not. And you say, if I live my life that way, I'm never going to go anywhere. Listen, servanthood is the way, the way to true success. It's the way. Servanthood is Christ-like. It does require humility. It does require faith. But listen, servanthood will open vistas and plateaus that you will never see any other way. Because he said, if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But if you'll choose to go low, then he's like, I'll, I'll. right. Christ Jesus, right? The, the, the man who was exalted above any other man came in and made himself as low as any, he's gone lower than anyone ever went, right? But now he sits exalted at the right hand of the Father. And then we've got prayer. Now prayer, and I'm going I'm to be good on time here. It, prayer, simply talking to God, maybe one of the most, well, I, perhaps the most powerful thing any human can do, save maybe giving our life for someone else, which I don't think we do without a bunch of prayer. But Scripture's clear, we can pray to God anytime, anywhere, about anything and everything. Paul said, and pray without ceasing. But honestly, again, if you'll think about it, like stewardship and like servanthood, on the surface, naturally, doesn't prayer also seem a little awkward? If, if you're new, you go, so I'm going to... I'm going to speak up into the sky. I might bow my head and close my eyes. I don't know why you guys do that. I'm going to, I might get on my knees. I might fold my hands. And in my time of greatest need, when I got, when I got like, oh, I'm really facing an up, like when I really need help, you, you say, pray. And then so like I say something, God, if you're there, it's Frank. Remember me? I live in Chattanooga. And um, I got a really big problem right now. Could you, and you? And you go, like, just something magic's going to happen? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. And honestly, you're right. It doesn't. It's altogether uncommon. It's, it's not it's natural. It's supernatural. Jesus said, speaking to his disciples, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Listen, listen. The most powerful and life-changing thing you may ever do in this life is simply ask God. Just ask the most powerful, life-changing thing we may ever do in this life is, is that thing that you go, that doesn't make any sense. It's just ask God. James, the brother of Jesus, sort of warrant what challenges us maybe. He says, often we have not simply because we didn't ask. We just didn't ask. Ian Bounds wrote an incredible book on prayer and in it he states, there's simply no force on earth equal to that of the power of prayer. It's pretty heavy, right? No force on earth that is equal to the power of prayer. And admittedly, these three things here that I've talked about, stewardship, servanthood, and prayer, they are, they are uncommon practices, uniquely Christian in the sense. Um, that is their origin for sure. They've been copied and mimicked by other religions, but nevertheless, these are things that are sort of more every day, right? We, we have an opportunity every single day with every single resource, every single cent that we got to put in a place that God wants us to spend it in a way that honors Him. We got a choice in every single scenario to choose whether or not we're going to be sort of servant-minded or not. And prayer is just something that's as common as every day. Those are, those are sort of like everyday uncommon scenarios. What I want to finish with here, what our two folks over here are going to do shortly, is not an everyday thing. You aren't baptized every day. And so let's talk a little bit about this sort of moment that's about ready to happen here in the hallway that's, that's happening there 
in these folks' life. So baptism, like what is it? What does it require? And um, what does it do, if anything? Well, it is a command first. It's a command, not simply a suggestion or a good idea. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's a command to obey, an outward symbol of an inward reality. It's a public identification with Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus said, if I live, speaking to his disciples, and he's speaking about, if I live, if you see me three days after this, after this crucifixion, if I live, speaking of the resurrection, you will live also. Baptism doesn't save a person, though often in Scripture, baptism actually occurred, you know, right part and parcel with someone's conversion. If you remember in the book of Acts, there's that Ethiopian eunuch, and he hears about Christ, and uh, it was uh, Philip that ran alongside the, 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 the chariot there, leads him to Christ, and the Ethiopian eunuch looks on and goes, there's water. What would forbid us from being baptized? Let's, let's do it right now. And, um, and so baptism doesn't save a person, but faith and a good conscience toward God are prerequ prerequisite. That is, it should be prior to a baptism. Peter says that baptism is a pledge of a good conscience toward God. And over the years, I have spoken to many folks that, you know, grew up in some particular setting where they were sprinkled as an infant or there was an infant, infant sort of baptism. But later on in life, they come to faith. They've got a greater understanding. And uh, it is a little difficult for an infant to actually pledge a good conscience toward anything, let alone God, right? And so folks come along and go, I, was, I had some sort of baptism experience as an infant, but now I've come to faith in Jesus Christ as an adult. My faith is now my own. My choice is now my own. I've got some greater understanding. Um, should I be baptized? And uh, I'd say, yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely be baptized. It's a pledge of a good conscience toward God. And, and you may have wondered, as I mentioned earlier, you know, having come to faith as an adult, is this baptism, even this baptism today for you? And, and if you're still sort of wondering, like, is it for me? I'd say, yeah, absolutely it is uh, for you. If God's been moving on your heart to publicly take the plunge today, I'd obey. You say, I've been saved for years, but like, what does it do? What's it for? Well, it's a simple act of obedience. And often, simple act, acts of obedience, especially when we don't necessarily understand. You know, you look on and go, this doesn't necessarily make sense, but I'm going to obey God. Simple acts of obedience have a way of sort of marking us for more obedience. Obedience tends to sort of tends to sort of you know beget more obedience, and obedience has a really great track record of being followed by great blessings. And that's my prayer for every person who's going to be baptized today in Chattanooga in some frigid water. And uh, do you guys warm the water here? Yeah, I'm not going to tell our people in Chattanooga. Be like, like, let's do it next week. We'll come back here, and flood the flood the deal. But my prayer is always, you know, Lord, this simple act of obedience to be publicly baptized, would you just use it to mark, would it just mark someone for a life of obedience and may this simple obedience kind of groove their souls toward obedience to you. Listen, and especially when it doesn't make sense. Because if you're going to go the distance with Jesus, he's going to ask you to do some things that you go, I don't under, I, this does not make sense. This, I, I do not understand. And that's when you, and listen, when we do not understand and we obey God, that's when God starts to do some things on our behalf that we don't understand. Isn't that great? We're just saying he's the one and there's no one else who can that turns graves into gardens. No one else can do that. Nobody else can take seas and actually make a highway straight through the sea. But this is, these are the kinds of things that don't make any sense that God does when people choose to say, I don't have to understand. I've just got to obey. So I'm going to obey and let the consequences, and let, I'll leave the results, quote unquote, to you. So you look on and go, like, nothing's going to happen today at your baptism. That's what the world was. Nothing's going to happen today at your baptism. Because all you're doing is getting wet. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to go publicly, practically, and right in front of all these people. They're going to be excited for me. I'm going to I'm going to publicly identify with Jesus Christ. I'm getting in that water. I'm coming up. You guys are going to bring me out of the water. I'm coming up out of the water. <laughs> We're going to celebrate that. And you go, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Except for the fact it matters. Why does it matter? Because it's what Jesus Christ stated that we should do in his word. Amen? That's what matters. So you watch and see. It was uh, October 1994 when my, my wife and I were soon to be married, we were baptized at the, at the 
on the water's edge. It was at the beach in South Florida. And uh, I can remember coming up out of the water, man, and the sky was blue and the clouds were white. And my, it, you know, I'd been saved for a couple of years. We'd just been traveling and we, could, we weren't at a place where we could be baptized. And um, it was just such a powerful scenario. Um, you know, yes, it's a picture. It's a picture of, uh, you know, a, a, a death to the old. And, and a, a, you're going to be raised out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life. Um, but listen, it, uh, it matters. And I want to say to you, awakened church, the, the Christian life really is an uncommon sense life. But if we'll step out and obey him when it doesn't make sense, he's going to do things for us that don't make sense either. And that's when it gets exciting. Amen.